So this morning, as we continue the series, The Gospel Matters, we have spent a couple of weeks in, well, we titled it Law and Grace, but the truth is we've kind of focused on the law to kind of say, here's where we started, here was the, here was the problem, here's the issue, and now today we are going to focus on grace, and I got to tell you, we are not going to come close to exhausting this topic, um, but we will do our best to to say as much as we can in this time so that we get kind of an understanding that grace is an overwhelming concept. It's, it's more than just some of the things we've heard in religious circles where grace is this idea where when we sin, then we need God to show us some grace. Uh, grace is much, much bigger than just something you wrap around yourself after you mess up. Grace is what's wrapped into you, even in order to keep you from messing up sometimes. And we're going to see that grace is an incredible, incredible revelation of just how much God loves you. As we've seen from the law, we saw that the law was given to reveal, to provoke, and to increase sin. So where most people thought that, that they needed the law to keep them from going crazy with sin, we saw actually that the law will make sin go crazy. It won't keep you from going crazy. It'll, it'll make sin go crazy in you. And we saw the result of the law, that it's the, a ministry of death and condemnation. It, it leaves us with a sin consciousness. It leaves us focusing on ourselves and our behaviors and our actions and how we can do better and try to keep from certain things in order to be okay with God. And we saw that the law could never do that for us. It could never make us, never make us okay with God, never make you perfect. No matter what stringent rules and commands and morals and codes you try to follow, no matter what to-do list you think is coming from God, your inability to accomplish that list would be revealed because of that list. So the law could never make you perfect. We saw that the law really doesn't show you what to do as many have believed. It really shows you what you could never do. That was the purpose of the law. But then we saw the release from the law. And, and I said this last week, I believe there's probably... I mean, there, there are other great truths in the New Testament, but I'm not sure there's one more clear than the fact that we are done with the law as believers in Christ. That, that Romans 10, 4 said, Christ is the end of the law. I don't think you can get clearer than that. He is the end of the law. Jesus, the person, the Savior, the Messiah, he ends the law for us, his people. And that tells us that not everything that's in the Bible not everything that's biblical is necessarily Christian. Isn't that interesting? That there are things that are, that are written in Scripture and they are all for us. They will benefit us, but it's not all written to us. And anytime we see the law, we know that it's somebody else's information. It's not for us anymore. The law has ended for those who are in Christ. And here's why, because he fulfilled it. He satisfied it by the perfect sacrifice of himself. We could never satisfy it by our offerings of sacrifices, so God himself offered Jesus, and that's the perfect sacrifice. And he not only brings us near, he makes our conscience clear as he has perfected us for all time through one offering, Hebrews says. So Jesus didn't sidestep the law. He didn't rewrite it. He didn't diminish it. He didn't deny it. He, did, he didn't reinterpret it. He didn't change it. And he didn't break it. He fulfilled it. He finished it. And then he gifted what he accomplished to you and to me. Because we could have never accomplished that. And that's what grace is. And we saw that once we have been released from the law, we can now release others from our own expectations, our own underwritten law, where we live according to expectations and we live according to what we expect from people or what we expect of ourselves. We now have the freedom and the privilege and the honor to live from desire instead of duty, from de delight instead of expectation. I've told people many times, if you want to expect something from somebody else, here's how you do it. You pay them. You pay them. It's the only way to do it. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that system, but that's never going to lead to love in a relationship. Because once a wage is earned, it's expected that the wage would be paid. And so all that's happening in that system is earning, deserving, and paying off. 
then you can have expectations. It's how we do our employment. I understand. But in loving relationships, if I put an expectation over somebody and they don't meet, live up to it, I'm the one who gets disappointed. And then I share, that, I share what I have with them and they're upset. And all of a sudden, the last thing that we experience in the dynamic of our relationship because of expectations is love. But if I can move that expectation in my mind to a desire and realize actually what I'm doing when I expect, I'm holding and trying to control what I truly desire. I expect my wife to communicate with me. See how it works? Actually, I desire that deeply. But as soon as I try to control it and put an expectation on it, I better start paying her. Does that make sense? We've been set free from that. We can release others because we ourselves have been released from God's expectations because he fully met his desire in us. I like what Andrew Farley says. He says the law breeds one of two things. It breeds defeat if you're honest or hypocrisy if you're not. That's it. That's the result of the law. Law keeps us focused on sin and it makes us the subject where grace keeps us focused on Jesus because he is the subject. In fact, I love this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. It's so clear. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and the purity of devotion to Christ. It's all about Jesus. When we talk about grace, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about grace, life, fellowship. That's Jesus' life in fellowship. It's all about him. He is the way, the truth, the life. And he loves you. And he gave himself for you so that he could give himself to you. And then he could live his life through you. That's what we're focusing on today. The grace of God that sets us free. And we've been looking at this passage in Romans chapter 5. We looked at it in reference to the law. It says the law came in so that the transgression would increase. So we saw that over the last couple of weeks. But I want to focus on the second part of this verse today. It says, but where sin increased, where this transgression increased, where sin abounded, it says grace abounded all the more. Do you know what that means? That the law is not greater than grace when it comes to not sinning, when it comes to freedom, when it comes to righteous living. Grace can get you there. The law never could. And we never have to worry about this, this lie out there that's in religious circles that says, you better be careful about your sin. You better watch it. You better manage it. You better be overcoming it. You better struggle against it, fight, fight against it. We can let go of that lie because we see that the issue is not focusing on sin. The issue is focusing on Jesus because where grace, where sin abounded, grace abounded all the more. You cannot out God's grace. Think about that for a second. Let that scare you. Let that settle in you and make, maybe there's a tension there that says, whoa, whoa, Tim, what are you talking about? Yeah, does, are you telling us to run headlong into sin that it doesn't matter if we I didn't say that. But do you know that the enemy is tagging you constantly and accusing you? He's an accuser of the brethren. And it says he stands ready day and night to accuse you. You've experienced this, haven't you? That at your slightest fault, at your slightest weakness, at your slightest mistake, you get tons of accusation, followed by guilt and condemnation. It's grace that sets you free from that. It's grace that focuses your eyes somewhere else and says, I don't have to think about that anymore. Actually, thinking about that has created more of it. I can actually set my eyes on Jesus, Hebrew says. Man, if we just got that, fix our eyes on Jesus. We are so fixated on our sin. He isn't. He has removed it as far as the east is from the west. He remembers it no more. So if you're remembering sin evermore, it's not coming from God. It's coming from an accusation. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So today we are going to look at the reason for grace. We're going to look at the result of grace. We're going to look at the release of grace. You know, moving from law to grace, it's moving from an impossible life we couldn't live up to. And moving into an, a life of impossibility that only Jesus can live through you. That's the great exchange. Where we give up what we couldn't do 
to receive all that God has done. That's what grace is. I, I don't know that there's a more eloquent way of putting it than the way Major Ian Thomas put it. I think this, is a, a, this might be a forward to the book Classic Christianity. I'm not sure, but this, it's, a, it's a long quote, but it is beautiful, so I'll ask you to just listen. Major writes this, There are few things quite so boring as being religious, but there is nothing quite so exciting as being a Christian. Most folks have never discovered the difference between the one and the other, so that there are those who sincerely try to live a life they do not have, substituting religion for God, Christianity for Christ, and their own noble endeavors for the energy, joy, and power of the Holy Spirit. In the absence of reality, they can only grasp at ritual, stubbornly defending the latter in the absence of the former, lest they be found with neither. They are lamps without oil. You can see he's aged. They are lamps without oil, cars without gas, and pens without ink. Baffled at their own impotence in the absence of all that alone can make man functional, for man was so engineered by God that the presence of the Creator within the creature is indispensable to his humanity. Christ gave himself for us to give himself to us. His presence puts God back into the man. He came that we might have life, God's life. Father, today as we look at grace, may we see Jesus. For it's all about him. Father, it's all about your son. As your word says, all things to be summed up in him. That none of the the world's equations, none of our personal equations make sense unless the summation of that is Jesus. Father, we we take a few minutes to, to look at this idea of grace. But, but it is greater than that. And I believe and trust that we will spend all eternity discovering and uncovering as you reveal the glories of what grace is all about. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I thought we would define grace. The Greek word for grace is charis. And, and it, it literally means Well, you see it there. It literally means gift, blessing, favor, or goodness. It's it's akin to the the old Hebrew word hesed. Pastor Tim Boswell did an elective hour a few weeks ago on this word hesed, which which means the loving kindness of God. Grace is this loving kindness of God. It's seen in the gift that he gives. It's seen in the blessings that he gives. It's seen in his favor and his goodness. That's what grace is. Maybe you've heard this acronym. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. Have you ever heard that phrase? That grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. I I think it's pretty good. It's the riches of God. It's the blessing of God. It's the goodness of God, the favor of God, all through what Jesus did. It's all seen in him, but it's gifted to you. Grace is a divine initiative where God is offering something to us because we could never offer enough to him. That's what grace is all about. And it's counterintuitive. You've heard me say that several times. It goes against the grain of our conditional and traditional thinking. It goes against the grain of worldly patterns and and thought processes and belief systems. The world is caught and trapped in an achieving economy and grace brings in a receiving economy that says it's not what you do that merits something before God, it's what he gifts you that does that. It's awesome. And and it's an empowerment for righteous and holy living. The religious community thinks that grace is sloppy and it's and it's messy and that it's that it's easy and it's just easy believism. And the indictment against grace is that it's too easy. You need to mix grace and law so that you got a complete picture of how we're to live with God. But actually, those two economies are diametrically opposed to each other. One cancels out the other. Christ is the end of the law, and He's brought in grace. It's exactly what John 1 says. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth. Notice it doesn't say we're just given. It wasn't just something given. It says it was realized through Jesus Christ. Meaning the embodiment of Jesus, the life that God lived in his own son 2,000 years ago, was the embodiment of what grace is all about. So that anybody that crossed Jesus' path would see exactly grace in action. They would see a love that they had never seen before. 
It's, it's why the teachings of Jesus are so amazing as he's explaining who he is and what he's about. And he's got to do it in parables and illustrations and all kinds of things. And they still didn't get it because it was the first time in all of creation that the glory of God would be embodied in a human. Not just through the seen through creation itself, but seen through one who was never created. He is grace. And then we see grace described. Titus 2, 11 and 12, these are some of my favorite passages to take people to when they think that grace is just kind of this sloppy substitute for righteousness. It says, for the grace of God has appeared. Who does that sound like? Bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness. You see, the first thing that Titus brings in is the idea that, that, that Timothy brings, is the idea that grace instructs us, teaches us, informs us to deny ungodliness it's not the excuse for sinning it's the remedy for sin then and 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 worldly desires and to live sensibly soberly with 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 a clear mind righteously and godly in this present age do you see that grace isn't for some future idea grace is for right now living that we can live soberly right now where we are. That we can, we can stand against the onslaught of all the lies that come against us. And we can live uprightly and righteously right now because of grace. Because of him. Grace, grace is not something that leads to more sin. That's like saying that water will lead to more thirst. Grace will never lead you to more sinning. When this was raised as a hypothetical question in Romans, they said, what shall we say then since we're under grace? Should we go on sinning? Paul answers that that question with with a resounding no. Do you not know, he says, who you are, that you were were baptized and you were buried with Jesus Christ? You died with him. You died to that. And you were raised to newness of life. Basically, Paul's response to shall we go on sinning is, Do you know that that's not who you are anymore? You're not a sinner. You're a saint. And if you go on sinning, you're going to find out that you don't like this anymore, that it doesn't fit you, that it doesn't bring contentment or fulfillment. It's not what you're really after. We've all tested those waters where we've fallen into temptation. We've tried what temptation offered. And at the end of it, because we're children of God with grace infused into us, we realize this didn't satisfy As the deer pants for the water, so our soul now longs after him, not sin. It'll never satisfy you again. Grace is not just what we we need after we sin. That's what we've heard so often that, that grace is what God brings in after you sin. No, grace is the empowerment to keep from sinning. Grace is what you need before you sin. That sounds funny, but you know what I mean. Grace is what you need to prevent that. Grace is not some sin excuse. Grace does not condone sin or inspire sin. It's not light on sin. Grace is how we came to Jesus. Grace is also how we walk with Jesus. Just as you entered into him by faith, by grace, through faith. So walk in him. So we see the reason for grace. Grace. The reason is, for, is Romans 5, 8. Look what it says. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know why we need grace? Because when we were helpless, hopeless, and godless, we had nothing to offer. What were we going to do to get right with God in that condition? The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There was nothing we could do to change our condition. We were helpless and ungodly. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. It was impossible to merit anything from God. We needed to receive something. We needed life. I mean, what could we do to get right with God? Read more, pray more, go to church more, give more. These sound so petty in light of what's really happened. What really happened in Adam was a death, a separation. Do you really think a little more Bible study is going to fix that? It's going to take an infusion of life granted to change that. I hear people talk about this phrase, total depravity. 
And, and yes, we see it right here in Romans. We see that we were, we were helpless. We were sinners. We were separated from God. If that's your definition of total depravity, I'm all for it. It means that you were separated and alienated from the life of God and you had no ability to change your condition. But total depravity is not the inability to choose to trust him. It's the inability to change your heart condition. Mankind cannot do that. The heart is God's playground. The heart is for God alone. And only God can change the heart. You can change your mind. You can change your attitude. You can never change your heart. Only God can do that. And he did it by grace through faith. This was prophesied in Ezekiel 36. He says, moreover, I'm going to give you a new heart I'm going to give you a new heart. Do you realize what what he's saying? He's not saying study more, pray more, work more, be more religious to get a new heart. He's saying, I'm going to give you one. It's a gift. It's grace. And when he does, he says, moreover than that, I'm going to give you a new heart. And I'm going to give you a new spirit, a new alive human spirit that's relatable to God. And he says, I'm going to put my spirit, his Holy Spirit, into your human spirit with this new heart that you have. And listen to what he says. And I am going to direct you. I am going to cause you to walk in my ways. Isn't that beautiful? That's what he prophesied in Ezekiel. That's what's happened in the new covenant. We've been given a new heart and a new spirit, and he's joined his spirit to our spirit. And now by dynamic of trusting him by faith, we walk in a different way. We walk by grace. No longer are we under this impossible standard of the law. We're under the freedom of what grace brings. And the result of grace, this is one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. It says, Romans 6, 14, for sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Here's the question. Do you find sin being a master over you? That you're struggling with it, that you're dominated by it, that you're obsessed with it, that, it that, that you're addicted to it. If you find those things happening, maybe it's because you're, you're under the false dynamic of living under the law. Know the truth. We're under grace. And under grace, you cannot serve two masters. Sin will never master you again because you are in Jesus Christ. If you're struggling with sin, it's an issue of growing in God's grace not trying to grow more in the law. He set us free from that. Now what masters you is life and righteousness. That's who masters you. It's Jesus. And he gave, as a result of grace, he gave you a new heart. Romans 6, 17 said that you you became obedient from the heart. Hebrews 10, 22 talks about a sincere and pure heart. 1 Timothy 1, 5 talks about a pure heart. If you look at, if you do a study of the word heart in the New Testament, you are going to find for the believer, it's using words like sincere and pure and obedient and new. These are the conditions of what God gave you by grace to your new heart. A result of grace is that we are totally and not partially forgiven. You're not forgiven a little bit. You're not forgiven yet. You're not forgiven until you are forgiven completely and fully so that you can throw sin away. You can throw off the sin that so easily entangles and run this race with your eyes fixed on Jesus. Another result of grace is Christ in you, his presence. And I know many times when, when, when I talk about this, I, 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 t- I try to tell people, I try to let them off the hook. Christ lives in you. Christ lives in me as a believer. But man, I don't always feel it. And if I could be really honest with you, I, I'm not so sure what I'm supposed to feel to make that true. When my team wins, I feel really good, and I I get excited. Maybe that's what it feels like. When I eat sushi, I feel really good and get excited. Maybe that's what it feels like. When I eat Milano's and Oreos, that's got to be what Christ in me feels like. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Listen, here's what Christ in you feels like. If you're a believer, however you feel right this moment, that's what it feels like because it's a fact. It's not a feeling. It's not based on how you feel. 
The, the religious community is engineering us changing our feelings all the time to try to then locate where God is. The thinking that by, how, by doing the right things and changing how we feel, we're inching closer to, the, to proximity with God. The fact of grace is that Christ is in you and it's regardless of how you feel. Amen. It doesn't mean your feelings don't matter and it doesn't mean they shouldn't be validated. Your feelings tell you the truth about one thing. What is it? About how you feel. That's okay. And be honest about it. Be honest. God's big enough to deal with how you feel. There are times I feel really lonely. There are times I feel really anxious. There are times I feel really happy or really sad or really angry or really frustrated. None of those, none of those make Jesus pack his bags and leave. Christ is in you and it's the only hope of glory. So the result of grace is that we're as clean and as close to God as we can ever be. Try that one on for size. Think about that. Let that change your perspective. That, that you're as close to God as you can ever be. You're as clean with God as you can ever be. That's not anything that circumstances can dictate or diminish. It's a gift. Another result of grace is that we're rightly related to God. It, it, we, are, we are right with him. We're righteous. That's what we saw in week one of the gospel matters. And in this grace, we stand. I love that. We typically think of grace for when we fall. This is grace in which we stand. We stand. We stand for and against. We stand for as we stand in his presence. Jude 24 says, blameless with great joy. That you can stand in the presence of God right now, because you do. And you stand in the presence of God, blameless. Meaning God isn't pointing a finger at you. He's got his arms wrapped around you. He's a proud papa of his kids. You stand blameless with great joy. Hebrews 4.16 says we can now approach the throne of grace boldly. <clears throat> we, don't have to, we don't have to cower to God. We don't have to be shy with God. We don't have to worry what's he going to do, what's he going to think. We don't have to be concerned about lightning bolts hitting us. We can go to God. We can approach this throne of grace boldly. And, and you know how that verse ends? To find help in time of need. You know what that means? Tell me when you're in need... And tell me where your help's going to come from. It's going to come from the throne of grace. It's going to come from, from more love and acceptance and forgiveness and compassion and righteousness, not less. So many people that think that too much grace will, will create sinning, it's crazy. It's unbiblical. We stand firm and for the truth over and over in the New Testament. This word stand uses the idea of standing firm right where you are. Why? Because the current of this world is pulling and pushing all the time. You know this. You know, even as our kids go back to school, it's one of our prayers for them that the current of this world system will not infiltrate their precious minds that they will know the truth and be able to stand firm against some of those things that come at them. That's what Ephesians 6 says. Put on the full armor of God. That's Jesus, by the way. That's grace. Yes, he's going to go and, and dissect it. Paul's going to do that for us and tell us it's a breastplate of righteousness, a helmet of salvation, a belt buckle of truth. It's all that stuff. Yes, it's, it's just describing what Jesus is in and through you. So that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. The devil is a schemer. He's a liar. And he's scheming all the time. But guess what? The answer is not figuring out all the schemes of the enemy. The answer is knowing the grace of God that causes us to stand firm. And another result of grace is that we reign with him right now. You've heard this passage. It's so beautiful it's, it's Frank's, I think it's Frank's favorite verse. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, that's Adam, much more, that's the idea, much more. 
greater than what Adam did, greater than death, much more. Those who receive, that's, that's you and me. Those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Not will reign in the afterlife, will reign in life. A result of grace is that we reign right now. It's royalty that reigns. If he's the king of kings and you're his kid, what's the kid of a king called? You're a son or a daughter of, of God. You are a prince or a princess. You reign. Not, not without your circumstances, in and through your circumstances. Reigning is never perfect circumstances. It's finding the victory through those circumstances. It's a result of grace. As a result of grace, we see the goodness of God. We stop seeing him as a judge. We see him as a father. It's what Jesus came to do. He came to, to tell us what God was like. Hebrews says he's the exact representation. If you want to know what God is like, if you want to know what the Father is like, look at Jesus. So many people have a different picture of Jesus than, than they do of God. Where do the two meet? Jesus is God. And he mirrors to us exactly what God is like. So all the forgiveness, the compassion, the sacrifice, the love, the acceptance that you find in Christ is because that's what God is like as your father. So by grace, we see the goodness of God. And the result is we have new life, new heart, a new perspective, and, and one more result of grace. I love this passage in 2 Corinthians 4.15. It says, For all things are, your, are for your sake, so that the grace, the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. That the, res the result of grace is the giving of thanks. So, so we see that in grace we stand, we reign, and we give thanks. That's what it's all about. We see how thankful we are when we know what he's done. When we know just what we've received. It, it, you, you don't have to trump up thanksgiving to somebody that gives to you. It's organic. That's why Thessalonians says, in all things give thanks. It's not religiously trying to remember to give thanks to God. It's actually remembering all that he's given and organically, super, uh, supernatural. Just, just the byproduct is thanksgiving. I had an uncle give me a car one time. I didn't have to remember to thank him. A car. It's crazy. What has God given us? And then we see the release of grace. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So, so grace is a gift of God. It, it's salvation. It's not your work of doing. It's a gift from him so that nobody brags. I mean, if you're going to brag, brag about God because he gave it to you. And then look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, literally poema, his masterpiece, his, his poem being written right now as he, as he lives his life in and through us, created in Christ Jesus for good works. How many people are, are living in the perspective of having such purposeless lives? If you're in Christ, do you see your purpose? That Jesus Christ created good works for you beforehand, that you should walk in them. This is the release of grace as we walk in the good works that he prepared for us. And this release manifests itself in obvious ways where we, we are called ambassadors for Christ. We are ministers of reconciliation. You know what the message of the church to the world is? It's a message of reconciliation. That God was in Christ reconciling the world. That God graced the world through Jesus Christ. And I beg you now, world, reconcile yourself to God. Receive it. That's what it means. This is the ministry we have. This is how we serve the world at large. This is what we are called to do. This is those good works that was prepared beforehand. We also have the ministry of loving one another. Jesus gave us a new command, not as the law said, where you love others like you love yourself. No. I know many people, they don't love themselves very much sometimes. He's not saying do that for others. 
No, a new command I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. This is the release of grace in and through our lives. And then we see Romans 15, 7. Therefore, accept one another just as Christ accepted us to the glory of God. And, and you've heard me say this, but acceptance doesn't require agreement. You can't live in a sin-cursed world and think that acceptance means agreement. Not if it's accept the way Jesus does. Jesus doesn't agree with everything that we have done or that we have believed, but he accepts us. Acceptance doesn't require agreement. It requires love. Did you know you can, and I say this to young people all the time. I said it to my son just a couple of weeks ago. Did you know you can love somebody and not withhold the truth? Did you know you can love somebody without compromising your beliefs? Did you know you can love somebody without saying that everything they do is okay? By grace, we stand. And we can risk the rejection of others because we know we have the acceptance of God. And we don't compromise truth to get there. We, we use it in love. That's what it says in Colossians. Look what he says. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, that's us, the church, put on a heart of compassion. Uh, Look at the descriptions of who you are. Watch this. A heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. I'm not here to preach against things, but I just want to ask you as as an idea. When you check your social media page... Whatever that is, would you describe what you see coming from people as compassion, kindness, humility? I'm I'm always amazed at how everybody becomes an expert on their phone. Humility, gentleness, and patience. These are descriptions reserved for those who are infused with grace. You don't find this in the world. You're not going to find this scrolling through your phone. This is found in you. This is who you are. Then it says bearing with one another. Literally long suffering with one another. Forgiving each other. And whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. This is who we are as the church. This is what grace looks like when we live out what's in us. That we love one another, accept one another. And like I said, by grace, you can love others without compromising one of love's highest attributes, which is truth. Love and truth go hand in hand. They cannot be separated. That's why Jesus says, I am the way, I am the life, and I am the truth. First John says, God is love. Do you see it cannot be separated? You are loved. Grace is the proof. And just as a comparison of what we moved from, from law, in order to move into grace, where the law says do, grace says done. Where the law emphasizes what you do, grace emphasizes what God did. The primary focus of the law is, is, is things like ought to's and should's and have to's and must's. It's duty, where grace moves us into desire, want to, and delight. The law produces defeat, guilt, condemnation. The fruit of grace is victory, security, acceptance, and joy. The law says do in order to be, but grace says you are, therefore you can do. The law says you need to fight against sin. Grace says you're dead to it, but you're alive to God. The law says you need to figure out and do God's will for your life. Grace says, trust God and offer yourself to him. Present yourself to him as a living sacrifice and God will bring forth his will in your life. Maybe my my best illustration for grace is a a reminder from a couple of weeks ago. You remember I I had said that um, I had gotten some new shoes and then I was up in the booth and showing them off and Mandy didn't like them. Do do y'all remember this? This is how grace works. So I showed you my socks, and what she didn't like were those striped socks. Well, I I don't disagree. They didn't go with the shoes, but I don't know who did this, but somebody left me a pair of socks. (laughs) 
And they didn't tell me who it was, so I can't thank them except to do it publicly and say thank you, whoever gave them to me. And I'm wearing them today, and I will show them to you. They're pizza socks. When I, thank you, I don't know who gave them to me, but I, they're super comfortable, by the way. Oh, I, I think we have an answer. Is it Miss Brenda? Well, thank you. I didn't know that was going to happen. Or had I just written a note? When I was wearing the striped socks, I gave you the law, don't look at my socks. I want to tell you what Grace says. You are free to look at my socks. Have at it. Now, if you don't like it, you see you don't want to. Do you see the difference? Grace says you can't do this. Don't do this. I mean, the law says you don't do this. Grace says you're free to do this. Now, what do you want? And I'm sure it's what you don't want is to look at these socks. <laughs> no matter how you slice them, they're cheesy. <laughs> By grace, you are made righteous. By grace, you have been changed from a sinner to a saint. By grace, you are completely forgiven. By grace, you have been given a new heart. By grace, you have a new righteous nature. By grace, you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. By grace, you are pleasing to God. By grace, you are made acceptable to God. By grace, you bear fruit for God, these good works. By grace, you have been granted eternal life. What the law could not do, God did by grace. And we'll close with Romans 5.2 through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in the hope of the glory of God. This grace causes you to stand firmly on the foundation of Jesus who is in you. Never buy the sales pitch of religion that says grace is sloppy, that it's easy, that it's, fr that it's free in the sense of that, it, that, it's, that it's cheap. It may be free to us, but it cost him everything to give it to you. In this grace we stand. Father, we thank you for the truth that sets us free. Father, we thank you for the, the spectrum of all things to be thankful for. That you didn't leave us in a lost and desperate condition that you initiated by grace to send your son so that we would be rescued. But not just rescued, Father, redeemed. And not just redeemed, restored. And not just restored and dwelt. Father, so that this grace that was given to us now would be in us and live through us in such a way that others could pick the ripe fruit that it produces through our lives. Father, as a body of believers we thank you and we praise you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.